Peter Sutcliffe had made the most of his time at Broadmoor. But one of his fellow patients would take Broadmoor's perks to a whole new level. I went down to the visiting hall at Broadmoor. I was taken to a, a formica table and I sat there. And a young man came up to me with a white coat on. And he said, hello. He said, I act as Ronnie Cray's butler. Can I get you a drink? The Cray twins, Ronnie and Reggie, ruled London's underworld throughout the 50s and 60s. They were powerful but feared, their celebrity status underpinned by violent assaults, torture and murder. So to remain in their positions, to be the alpha males, they couldn't accept any disrespect. So I think that was part of what drove their violence. The twins had seemed untouchable, but on the 9th of March, 1966, Ronnie's actions would begin their downfall. At 8.30 p.m., he walked into the Blind Beggar pub and shot and killed George Cornell. No right-thinking man would have shot another gangster in cold blood, in front of witnesses, in a pub. I think Ronnie was, was ready to be caught. Three years later, both twins were convicted of murder and handed life sentences. Inseparable since birth, the twins were about to lead very different lives behind bars. And what would divide them was mental illness. At the age of 22, Ronnie had been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Ronnie's ongoing mental illness problems definitely drove forward the violence that the Crays committed. His twin Reggie was a calmer guy, but then Ronnie, Ronnie demanded retribution. He demanded violence, not just because he wanted to spread the word that they were a scary pair, but also because he enjoyed it. Ronnie even used hot pokers on some of his enemies and took great delight in watching those pokers sizzle the skin of an enemy. After a stint in prison with Reggie, Ronnie was moved to Broadmoor in July 1979. It would be his home for the next 16 years. And it was from here that he would tell his story to his biographer, television presenter Fred Dynage, starting with his very first day at Broadmoor. I will never forget the day I came to Broadmoor because no patient ever does. I was taken to what they call the admission ward. I was weighed and my height was measured. Then I was told to get into a bath. The male nurses, the screws, stood watching me all the time. If you behave yourself, it's heaven. If you don't behave yourself, it's hell. Ronnie found a way to play by Broadmoor's rules and soon became known as the Duke of Broadmoor. And the place where he showed off his status was the visiting hall. Former model Maureen Flanagan was a friend and a regular visitor. Well, the first time I went, I went with Charlie Cray, the elder brother. When we walked in, we were on time. In fact, we were five minutes early. And we sat down and I thought, well, everybody else has got a visit. And it's gone two o'clock and I'm looking, I'm looking. It's now quarter past two. And I sort of, I'm impatient to, to see him. And then the jingle jangle of the keys. And you could hear these leather shoes on this wooden floor. I heard marching feet. And when he walked in, you saw heads turn and people poking each other and saying, that's Ronnie Cray. And I just looked at him, I thought, well, you look exactly the same as the last time you were on the street. He was immaculate dressed, like an Italian suit, white starch shirt, beautiful Italian silk tie, hanky, gold watch. I thought, oh my God, I went, you look, you look wonderful, Ronnie, you look smart. He said, well, I've got to keep up appearances. With a little help from his visitors, Ronnie was able to maintain aspects of his former life of luxury. I took a tailor 
into Broadmoor every October. He said, I've got to have a new suit. And I thought, I said, Ronnie, why have you got to have a new suit? You're not going anywhere. <laughs> Do you go to the disco in here? Because I'd heard there's a disco on Saturday. He said, I don't want to go with those, mix with those people. He said, you know, they're all mad in here. Ronnie had respect for the other patients, but Ronnie always regarded himself, uh, probably quite rightly, uh, in, within the Broadmoor, Broadmoor hierarchy, he regarded himself as being the top dog, the, the main man. And central to his status was his butler, who was actually a fellow patient. I had a chat with this young man who told me his name was Charlie Smith, and he was a double murderer, and he was a very good friend of Ronnie and did a lot of jobs for Ronnie around the hospital. And then he went like that as though he was in a, a, a posh restaurant. And up come this boy and he said, what can I get you, Ronnie? You remember what I asked you to get in the kitchen? He said, yes, Ron. Go and get them then. Why haven't you bought them with the tea? He said, well, I had to carry the tray. I'm going now. And up came two strawberry tarts. I just couldn't believe it that he could order this sort of delicacy in a place that is really um, an asylum. One aspect of the visiting room that Ron couldn't control was the company. He said, there's that slag over there. And I thought, where, where am I supposed to look? Very often at an uh, adjoining table would be Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, who wasn't allowed to talk to Ronnie Cray or even look at Ronnie Cray because the Cray twins had no time whatsoever for for the people who'd offended against children or women. And then he said, Maureen, get up and move. I said, no, I'm okay here, Ron. I'm fine. He said, no, please, move around until I tell you where to, to stop the chair. So we all had to stand up and, and move so that I wasn't in the eye line of Peter Sutcliffe. It was in the visiting room that Ronnie would start to tell his life story to Fred. Most of our early conversations took place in that visiting hall. Then Broadmoor began to trust me more and we were given a private room to converse in. Eventually, Fred would get to see parts of Broadmoor that no outsiders would ever see. He was once able to bring in a camera and catch this rare glimpse of Ronnie outside his room. He really had quite a smart room there. He'd been allowed to decorate it the way he wanted it. All sorts of yellows and purples, which were very much his colours. And a nice dressing table with all his little ornaments and photographs and things on it. He loved his music. He was allowed a record player in his room. It was very much a Ron kind of room at last, and it, it felt almost like a hotel bedroom. Ronnie Cray had played by Broadmoor's rules in order to have a comfortable life. But one of his fellow patients was about to unleash a wave of destruction on Broadmoor itself. You have to walk across a big courtyard. And um, on a particular time, I walked across the courtyard with Mrs. Cray and Charlie Cray, and we heard a commotion. There was shouting, and screaming, you know, an alarm was going on. <laughs> we looked up, we heard, hello, hello. We looked up on the roof, and Charlie Bronson was throwing down all the slates and absolutely demolishing the room and when he saw Charlie Cray and Mrs Cray he was waving and stopped stopped what he was doing until we were passed over to you know the courtyard and into Broadmoor and then we heard this dreadful commotion again the man on the roof had arrived at Broadmoor as Michael Peterson but would later be known as Britain's most violent prisoner Charles Bronson Michael Peterson literally emerges as Charles Bronson on the roof of Broadmoor. His extraordinary behavior was about to bring him fame, but also put him in conflict with Broadmoor staff. 
I would not like to be a nurse on shift that had to medicate Bronson against his will. I mean, he was a big, violent man. But there was one individual who came to accept that he'd never be free. Ronnie Cray. Once he was in Broadmoor, he felt safe. No one's going to attack you and you're not going to have to attack people because you'll be medicated properly. He was quite happy with his life in there. He loved his gardening. Four mornings a week when the weather was good, he'd be in the back gardens of the hospital. He was very happy doing his painting and writing his po He loved writing poems. He really was quite a sort of gentleman of leisure, really. The only problem was he was stuck within the four walls of Broadmoor. But even at Broadmoor, despite the heavy medication, Ronnie's dark moods would occasionally take over. When he was in Broadmoor, you'd know it was a bad day. During the visit, he used to rub his hand, do this to his hands. And I used to look at the other, um, the other visitor and say, you know, and then about quarter past three, he'd look at the clock, look at his watch and say, I've got to go now. I'd say, oh, but Ronnie, we've got another half an hour. No, I've got to go now. He knew. He knew it was one of his bad days. And I'd say, oh, Ronnie, what's the matter? And he'd say, no, it's best I go. And decades after the crime that had brought him to Broadmoor, Ronnie showed no signs of remorse. The only thing that, that always saddened me about Ronnie was, I'd say, Ron, you know, do you feel sorry for what you did? You know, do you feel sorry for shooting George Cornell and killing him? No. Oh. Ronnie said to me, his actual quote was, um, when he shot George Cornell, uh, the actual words he used were, I've never felt so fucking alive. Which shocked me, you know, as a law-abiding citizen, I found it quite shocking. He said it was better than sex. He actually said that. Oh, that was the best feeling I've ever had. I've, I've got a real high, I'm on a high of that. With his gangster life behind him, Ronnie would look for new highs. And to the surprise of many, he would use Broadmoor's visiting room as a place to find a wife. Well, Ronnie always said, he, he, he said, I'm not homosexual, I am bisexual. I like men and I like women. And I would presume, you know, I mean, I don't have any knowledge, but I would presume that, you know, that he had his friends within, within Broadmoor. Ronnie would marry not once, but twice within Broadmoor's walls to women who had written him letters. His second wife, Kate Howard, was 23 years his junior. She was blonde and bubbly, a kissagram girl. She went to Reggie first, and he said, go and visit Ronnie. And after, you know, after half a year or seven months, whatever, Kate, you and me are going to get married. I knew I was going to marry you the first time you walked in here. She said, well, I didn't. I think someone also had said to him, look, Ron, if ever you want to get out of here, if ever you want to get parole, you need to have a nice, steady home life. I'm sure that's why he got married, because he'd got this dream of, this dream of freedom, which, of course, uh, he never realised. Ronnie never did get his freedom. In March 1995, at the age of 61, he had a heart attack at Broadmoor and died two days later. If you enjoyed the video, please join our Facebook group. It's called Praise Crime Lords of London. We're a friendly moderated group with over 1,000 Cray and other celebrated gangster videos available for view. There's also thousands of images in the photos sections. The link for the group is in the YouTube description section. I hope we see you.